Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Continuing our study of the book of Acts. We've made our way through Acts, or made our way to Acts chapter 17 this morning. In Acts 16, we saw Paul and his team in Philippi, where a demon-possessed girl confronted them. I, 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 I love the picture as this, this demon was running after them and was yelling out, Hey, these guys are, are preaching the true gospel of the Most High God. And Paul just gets tired of that demonic voice. I wish I could do a demonic voice like that. But uh, Paul gets tired of it, and he exercises the demon from her. And of course, now she's not making any money for her owners. And they get in trouble. They get thrown in jail. In the middle of the night, after being beaten, put in shackles, and locked to stocks, and they're in the middle of the night singing and praising God and praying. And an earthquake frees them all, but they don't leave, and the jailer is saved, and his family, and quite, a, quite an event happened in Philippi that night. Paul was led by the Holy Spirit in how to deal with this situation. And that's where we pick up the story. Paul and Silas are politely asked to leave town because of the struggle that would take place. We are working through the book of Acts, the beginning of the journey, and the title of my message this morning is Stand Tall Despite the Obstacles. You're going to have obstacles. Jesus told you that. I'm, I'm constantly amazed at, at believers who think, well, now that I'm saved, everything will be just perfect. That's just bad theology. It's bad doctrine. It's poor Bible scholarship. They just don't know what God said. God said, look, it's going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be tough. So stand tall despite the obstacles. Beginning in chapter 17, verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollyanna, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Here's your map that you've seen multiple times. They're making their way through this region here. They had been in Philippi. They made it down to Amphipolis and Apollyanna down here. So they're going through what is today Greek, Greece, then Macedonia, part of, of the Greek area, but it was a, a colony, uh, a, a region, if you will, of, uh, of Rome. Thessalonica was the capital of the region of Macedonia. Thessalonica was an extremely important city was named after the half-sister of Alexander the Great, so it had historical significance. It's the modern city of Salonika that still has great shipping significance. It's situated on the northern coast of the Gulf of Thermae, on the northern end of the Aegean Sea. It is one of the largest shipping ports into the region. It was... <coughs> At the time, it was a well-protected seaport that was deep water. Big ships could get in there, and they could offload and load a bunch of stuff. It sat right on the Via Ignatia, one of the Roman highways. So all the travel east to west out of, uh, out of Asia into Europe went through Thessalonica, a big seaport. So it was a, it was a strategic city. It was one of the most important cities in the region. Paul's travel plans normally, normally focused on church planting in hub cities like Thessalonica. Paul didn't go to just every little burg. He went to places where he could plant a church that could then be responsible for planting churches all around. And we'll see that's exactly what happened. It was a sure way to, to grow the young church, put it in a, in a fast-growing area, where people would come and go and see them spread around. Paul would also go to the synagogue first. This is where Paul would find people that were focused on Jehovah God. 
not just Jews, but the only place in the Greco-Roman world that you could find out information about God was in a synagogue. Not just for Jews, but anybody that wanted to know more about who Jehovah God was. With the dominance of the Greco-Roman mythology system, there was no real place that they could go to learn about Jehovah God. And so the synagogue became a place not just for Jews, but for others. Now, many, many Gentiles became proselyte Jews, but a lot worshipped God, but didn't become proselyte Jews. So here's my first question for you today. I want you to dig deep into your mind. What action should we take in 2021 to emulate God's plan? I'm sorry, Paul's plan. <clears throat> Going into those strategic places and then seeing the gospel move out from there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, in our gathering, talk to whoever we can. Sometimes we have to be someplace on purpose. Ooh, that's good. You get a gold star for the day. Anybody else? I think Paul's plan of, first, of going first to the synagogue to find people who were interested in God and learning more about God indicates that we need to follow the direction of the Holy Spirit. We know that nobody seeks after God apart from God drawing them. So people that are seeking God, the Holy Spirit has already begun to work with and prepare them. They've, the Holy Spirit has already tilled the soil for you to plant the seed in. So we need to recognize those around us that God is tilling the soil in. We need to look around. Who is it that God is dealing with? Maybe it's somebody that comes to you and says, look, i got a problem. I need to talk to you. Maybe it's a coworker that just experienced a loss or a great, a great event in their life. Maybe it's a family member that, that's struggling or, or somebody that has some exciting thing happen. The Holy Spirit works through all sorts of ways. Pay attention to what the world, what's going on in the world around you. In our study of the book of Acts, we've seen the Holy Spirit moves the, move the teams around all over the place, prevented them from going where they wanted to go, and sent them to where he wanted them to go. Pay attention to what the Holy Spirit is doing. Pay attention to where he moves you, who he has in your way, to deal with, who he puts in your way to talk to. Linda's example of the of the, the two men when we were eating breakfast down in Bonita after our first swim lesson was perfect. Just to be able to have a converse, little bit of a conversation with them and to thank them for being who they are. Paying attention to what God is doing around you. Don't just assume he's going to come and and uh, take a hammer or a two-by-four and say, boom, do this. He's not necessarily going to do that. He's going to lead you into showing you people to talk to. Now it's your job to do that. Sometimes people are moved into our path, and we have to take opportunities. Sometimes he moves us into their path, and we have to take opportunities. Sometimes people were gathered to Jesus and brought to the team to share the gospel. That's part of the gathering process. Sometimes we take the gospel to people, and other times we take people to the gospel. If you, can't, if you don't feel confident, you should, but if you don't feel confident in sharing the gospel, bring them to a place where they can hear the gospel. That's pretty simple stuff. We all need to get better at recognizing the opportunities God gives us to share or to gather. Pay attention to what happens in your day, who the Lord puts in your way, and pay, pay attention to what he wants you to do. And Paul went in, as was custom on, on three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, 
this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. I love how Dr. Luke describes what Paul would do. He would go to the synagogue every Sabbath and there reasoned with the people that he would find in the Sabbath. He would reason with them. And reasoned is the Greek word dialegeto, which means that Paul sat down with the men in the synagogue and taught them through question and answers, through a Socratic exchange. The Socratic method of teaching involves discussion between teacher and the various students. The teacher asks questions as well as answers questions. There's some debate and even some lecture, but there's talking, there's discussion, there's questions. Many have commented that you enjoy our Bible studies on Wednesday night much more when we have more discussion. And it's not just me bloviating, but we have a discussion. We, we talk back and like we used to do around the table. We have these long, drawn-out discussions about a topic. That's Socratic teaching method. I enjoy that time. It's harder, but I enjoy it, and I think you learn better. And I think the Apostle Paul recognized. Now, he was a gifted, gifted teacher. He was trained as a Pharisee to be a good teacher of the law. And he knew how to do it. So he went into the synagogue for three weeks, and he reasoned with them. What does it say he reasoned? That it was necessary for the Christ... We'll deal with that word in a minute, Christos. To suffer and to rise from the dead, saying that Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. Paul didn't go into the, into the synagogue like a bull in a china shop and say, you've got to do this. These people were already experienced with the, word, with the Old Testament. They already understood some of the Old Testament. So he didn't just go in there and tell them, this is the way it is. He reasoned with them. He debated. He had a Socratic exchange with them. So that they would see that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Paul referred to Jesus as the Christ, which means the anointed one. Christ Christos means anointed. He was selected by God and anointed for a specific role. To be the Messiah, the Mashiach. Of the, of the people. Paul was teaching and debating with the men in the synagogue. And what he was saying to them would eventually be written out in his, in his uh, various letters and epistles. And it, it eventually would become known as Christology. The doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of the anointed one. I wonder if years later, if the men that were sitting in there in Thessalonica in those sessions with Paul, if later as the letters that Paul would write to the churches would be circulated. I, wonder if, I remember when he taught that first. Wouldn't that be cool? I wonder how that played out in the early church. Paul was teaching them in person what he later would write out in his letters. That would be just way cool to experience Paul's doctrine class firsthand. So here's another question for you. They're, they're, they're harder questions today, I admit. How can you use Socratic teaching method in your context, in your people, the people you talk with, in the places that you go? How can you use the Socratic method? Ask, ask questions about where they're at and, and, and go from there in, in the discussion. Good. I've given you some exposure over the years to apologetic arguments so that you can have some facts and some, some arguments um, to use in debates and discussions with others around you. You shouldn't be afraid of having those discussions. 
You don't need to be a PhD to, to be able to have those discussions. You can do that. You can talk to people about those things. It's a great way to present the gospel. We spent a long time dealing with the resurrection of Jesus just so we had some familiarity with not just what Scripture says, but what does history say? And why you can have some confidence in what Scripture says. The difficulty in the Western church is that we've become more excited about a new song than we are than, than we are about what God says in his word. We always have to review new songs to make sure they're theologically right. Because the, the poor thing about the Western church is most of our theology comes from greeting cards and song lyrics. Just the fact, you need to learn better than that. And so we have to go through all of our songs to make sure that they're theologically correct. So that we're not feeding you poor theology in song. But we try to teach you what God says and ways to present it so you can have the conversation with somebody. Now, you may not be able to win. They may still be pig-headed and not, not listen but you have the ability to speak the gospel into their life. And so Paul did that. And some were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did many of the devout Greeks and a few of the leading women. Holy Spirit has been at work. He's been at work in the hearts of people there in Thessalonica. So Paul spends three weeks debating and having Socratic discussions with the, with the men in the synagogue, with the people in the synagogue, and some of them were persuaded. They became followers of Jesus. Both Jews, Greeks, or Gentiles, including some leading women in the city. They believed what Paul was teaching. And they became followers of Jesus. I find it really interesting that Dr. Luke states that some of them joined with Paul and Silas. Throughout much of the second missionary journey, Silas has been kind of a silent partner. Everything focused mostly on Paul. But here Dr. Luke says some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. Silas is brought to the forefront here in the synagogue. Remember who Silas was. Silas was a representative from the church in Jerusalem, a Jew from the church in Jerusalem, authenticating that Paul was legitimate in what he was teaching. Remember, Paul and Barnabas left the council, Jerusalem council in Acts 15, and Silas was sent with them to be one of the ones that said, yes, this is what we said. So now here in a Jewish synagogue, remember the last place they went, they didn't have a synagogue, Silas is kind of in the background. Now they're in a synagogue, and here is Silas more in the forefront again. Silas was a larger factor in the discussion and in the leadership of the group. But the Jews were jealous. And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in a uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. Here's a little, little factoid that you can store away. Almost always, when you see a reference to the Jews, it's not an overarching statement of all Jews. It is usually a reference to Jewish leadership. So who's, who's jealous here? The Jewish leadership. The people that make their money from all the Jews coming to the, to the um, synagogue. The Jews that were in control of how Jews lived, the leadership, they were jealous because now everybody was beginning to follow Jesus and Paul and Silas. Dr. Luke is telling us the Jewish leaders were the ones that were causing the problem. The Jewish leadership went out of, their, out of their way to solve this. So they went to the, to the day laborer hangout for bad guys. They went to the place where they could find some bad guys. Trust me, they are all over the city. If you know where to look, you can find hangouts of bad guys that you can go and hire for not a whole lot of money. 
pay them a little more money, they won't talk, and they'll commit crimes for you. There's places like that all over our community. That's what they did. They went to the bad guy hangout and got some guys to cause problems. So Dr. Luke tells us that they went out, got some wicked men of the rabble, and they formed a mob. I love the psychology and sociology of the mob mentality. People will do things they don't normally do when they're engaged in a mob, good or bad. I think sometimes our evangelistic outreaches are mob mentality for, for good, while what we saw last summer, the summer before last, that's true bad behavior mob mentality. People were doing things they wouldn't ordinarily do, but they got all caught up in the mob. The mentality of the mob is shaped by a few who cause it to get formed, and that's what, that's what Dr. Luke is telling us here. They went out and got some bad guys, told them, let's create a mob, let's, let's turn this city upside down, let's create a, an uproar, and they did. Now, Dr. Luke doesn't give us all the narrative, but we know that Paul was staying at the house of Jason. We don't know a lot about who Jason was. I think he went on to become the pastor there at Thessalonica, but he's a, he's a leading somehow. Whether he's a Jew or not is up to debate. I think he probably was, but he became a leader in the church. And he's hosting Paul and team. He hosted the team and was a leader in the church there in Thessalonica, and I think maybe even its pastor. And Satan then uses the mob. They can't find Paul and Silas, so they go after Jason. He's with them. He's part of the group. So let's go and attack him. Satan will use every opportunity he can and every method he can to disrupt the church and the church's ministry. So here the mob goes after Jason. And we just need to trust God. We need to trust Jesus to build his church as he sees fit. The Jewish leaders commission the mob to find Paul and put a, a beating on him. They wanted Paul to leave before the church got very strong. I see, I see Satan working in the background to thwart the growing ministry of a church planted in a hub city that then could outreach to the cities around. Verse 6, And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men have turned the world upside down, have come here also. I want bad guys to say that I've caused the world to turn upside down for Jesus. That's what they're saying. This is a tremendous compliment to Paul and Silas. The bad guys are saying they've turned the world upside down. They've come here too. Now, of course, from their vantage point, that's a bad thing. From the gospel's vantage point, it's a pretty good thing. They've turned the world upside down and they've come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And the people of the city, the people and the city authorities were disturbed by, uh, when they heard these things. And when they taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The mob couldn't find Paul and Silas. So they went after the man that was hosting them and some of the other believers. The mob was bringing charges against Jason, claiming that Jason and the others were affecting, uh, in effect leading an insurrection. They were saying, listen, they're preaching there's another king other than Caesar. The civil leadership of Thessalonica was not really happy about that issue. Dr. Luke says they were disturbed. As a Roman capital city of an area, they could get away with a lot of things. Rome gave them a lot of autonomy. But they couldn't get away with not having Caesar as their king. 
They couldn't get away with espousing loyalty to anyone other than Caesar. But their their, their recourse was a little limited. They couldn't just beat Jason and the others. They were all Roman citizens. They couldn't just go out and beat them. They couldn't just arrest them. Even though that had happened to Paul in Philippi, they knew Jason. They knew he was a Roman citizen. They couldn't just do that. So they took a bond from Jason, and they let him go. Any more problems, and Jason would lose the bond. Not an uncommon practice. Jason got the idea it was time for Paul to go. And so Paul and Silas go. Paul and Silas would leave the next night, and we'll see in the next pericope what happens then. We'll see where they go. They head on to, toward Athens. But we also learn some more information in Paul's letters to the Thessalonians about what's going on there. So I want to take a little bit of time in our conclusion this morning to look at what Paul says about the church in Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians 2.18 Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. Paul's escorted out of town, kind of rushed out of town, gets to spend about three weeks there before he gets removed from the scene. Paul viewed what had happened in Thessalonica as an act of Satan trying to thwart the ministry there. I wanted to come back to you, but Satan kept prohibiting me. I suspect Paul tried several times to get back to the new church there, but just couldn't get there. A real frustration, I suspect. But that doesn't mean that the church there didn't grow. doesn't mean that there wasn't true things happening there. 1 Thessalonians um, 5, uh, I'm sorry, 1, 5. Because our gospel came to you, not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, you know what kind of men we proved to be uh, among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and the Lord. For you received the word much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Paul wanted to get there, but couldn't. And he writes a few years later that, they had, that the church in Thessalonica had become examples to the other churches despite the affliction that they were going through. We know that the church in Thessalonica planted a bunch of churches in the region. They became the sending church for all the church plants in Macedonia and Achaia, two Roman provinces. The church planted many other churches in the region, and they were seen as the example. This is how you do it. Paul was there three weeks run out of town, and the church became the hub of churches all throughout the region. I love this. I just love the picture that's painted there. A church is planted in three weeks, and it becomes the hub of all the other churches in the region. Paul and Silas and team were run out of town, and yet the church still is strong. Paul wanted to get back to them. The church is still strong. The real transformation occurred in the city, such that the reputation of the church was spread all over. Paul also wrote in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 14, For you brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind. 
by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their, of their sins. But wrath has come upon them at last. Paul praises the church in Thessalonica because they suffered abuse. The city went after the church in Thessalonica, just like in Judea. The war that was waged between Satan and the church impacted the church in Thessalonica extremely hard. What is clear is that the church in Thessalonica had a different start, a difficult start, a difficult life, was impacted by Satan's war on the church, just as many churches, other churches have been. But the church was effective in ministry, was effective in service. They never gave up. They never stopped serving the Lord. Despite the personal cost of their service, they followed the Lord and they did it well. There's a great deal that the church of today could learn from the church in Thessalonica. Very often, new churches today face a little difficulty and just give up and close. Very often, churches struggle in the first couple of years and close. More churches close than open. Sometimes they need to close. Sometimes a church needs to close. But I would argue that a little faith and a little perseverance would go a long way to making the church effective. One of the things I'm proudest of at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, despite the setbacks, despite being told several times we should close, Friendship Grace Brethren still supports missions in several places and through several ministries. When many churches struggled during the pandemic, we actually were able to give to them to help them. Churches much larger than us. Through the first three quarters of this year, our offerings are up over 18% over anticipated offering. I don't understand why, other than God's working. We may not be big, but we're dedicated to learning and living God's word. There are still things for us to learn. There are still things for us to do. We need to get better at gathering. We all need to get better, better at gathering. We need to get better at sharing the gospel with others. We need to get better at many things as we continue to follow Jesus and become more like the church planted by Paul and Silas in Thessalonica before they were run out of town. A small church begins in three weeks and becomes the example to the region. And in many ways, we're an example to a lot of churches in a lot of ways. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for the truth of your word. Thank you that Paul and Silas were busy about serving you. And even in running out of town, being run out of town, they recognized the need for the church to continue. And the church continued and served you and honored you and glorified you and became the example to the entire region. Thank you for that, Father. Father, I pray for this body here that we would always follow you. We'd always be obedient. We'd always do the things you want us to do. Remind us of those that you put, put in our way to, to gather, to talk to. That we might be more than just a bumper sticker, more than just a Facebook post. But we might actually get involved in their lives and seek them. And encourage them and help them and try to gather them to you. Thank you for this group of believers. Thank you for the love they have for, for us, for me, for you. We trust that you would always be honored by them. Thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.